Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jordan Pannell, studying a PhD at the University of Sheffield, and I'm here to present a physics-guided machine learning approach to understanding loading distributions from explosive events. This work is supervised by Dr. Rigby and Professor Panutsis, uh, both of the University of Sheffield, and it's sponsored by the EPSRC and in collaboration with DSTL. So firstly, why should we care about this area of research? Ultimately, inadequate design against blast loading can lead to a loss of life. But to be able to understand how a structure would respond to a blast event, we need to know exactly what that blast loading is. To be more precise, we need to understand both the magnitude and the distribution of the loading. That is, how does the magnitude of the loading change along the span of a target column or a span of a slab? To understand a bit more about blast loading and where this structural loading comes from, it's useful to know what an explosion is. The initial detonation of a charge converts fairly instantaneously into a highly dense gas. These detonation products expand outwards and shock the air, which essentially means an instantaneous increase in density and pressure. This shockwave then propagates through a medium, so typically the air or the atmosphere, and this will propagate until it lands on a target. The shock there then transfers momentum to a structure, and it's this transfer of momentum that leads to the generation of a structural response. So it can be seen here on the right hand side, there are two broad themes in the physics of explosions. Firstly, we have load quantification, and then we have the structural response. So the research I'm presenting today focuses on the load quantification. Considering more generally a blast or explosive event, we can typically classify it in two ways. Far field and near field are terms that describe the relative distance between a charge from a target. In the far field, the shockwave has detached from the explosive detonation products and produces a uniform loading distribution across the target, typically. Whereas in the near field scenarios, this loading distribution is not uniform and the shock front is not detached from the explosive fireball. The result is that far field scenarios can be predicted with very high accuracy from previous semi-empirical methods, whereas the near field scenarios are far more complex and are not accurate to use these approaches. So when a structural engineer is designing for blast resilience, they typically need to consider a few aspects. Firstly, is the element that's being analysed a key element? That is, is it key to the structural integrity if it were to fail? What's the likelihood of this event to take place? Because clearly it would be impractical to spend significant amounts of the budget on an event that's unlikely to occur. And then we have uncertainties to do with the charge properties. So that's the shape or the type or the mass. So these uncertainties typically mean it's impractical for engineers to wait for accurate computer uh, computational fluid dynamics models that may take days or weeks to run and they're only suitable to a specific scenario. So therefore, there is a need to develop a probabilistic risk-based approach that can analyze a large range of scenarios very quickly. This would allow a suitable risk profile to be chosen according to the client's budget or expectations. As an overview of our research, we've used these computational models or CFD models to produce large training data sets of loading information. This CFD software has been validated against experimental data we have at the university, so we know we can trust it. And the left hand side here shows roughly what the experimental schematic is. So we have a, a spherical charge of mass W located at distance R away from a wall. And along that wall are pressure gauges that are spaced linearly from 0 to 80 degrees. And this gives us an output of the pressure time history, so how the pressure varies with time. By integrating this pressure time history, we can get an impulse time history. If we take the maximum of that impulse time history at each point, we get the maximum load that each point experiences. In other words, these gauges output the loading distribution that we're interested in. So the right hand side shows an example overview of this data set. This example data set consisted of nine separate experiments of the same mass of explosive but at nine different distances away. So that's changing R from that experimental setup on the left hand side. And as an output, we record the maximum impulse at each gauge. 
the actual data set we used in our later models was much bigger than this. So here on the left hand side in the box is a summary of our predictive model that we produced. From this single equation, we can essentially recreate that surface you saw on the previous slide. So this term in red gives us our maximum impulse value. The black term gives us a weighting between zero and one that describes how that maximum changes or how it varies with the angle of incidence. And the blue term scales the result for different charge masses. You'll notice the equation is only suitable for certain values of Z. Z is known as scale distance and it's a metric used in blast engineering to standardize across different scenarios. Essentially, we divide the standoff distance by the cube root of the charge mass. But for the sake of this presentation, we can consider Z as analogous to the standoff distance. So the model inputs here are Z, the angle and charge mass, and we can get the specific impulse at that point from the simple equation that we proposed. To put this into context, the right-hand side shows two validation exercises we performed. The red solid lines indicate the output from the CFD software and the black dashed line is the prediction from our model. So firstly, this shows the flexibility of our approach as we have analyzed two completely different charge masses, one of five kilos and the other of 250 kilos at different distances. And we have good agreement between both models. The real benefit is the time saving. So those CFD models, the red solid lines, took about six hours each to run, whereas our model took a fraction of a second. And it's something you could all do on your phone calculators right now. So these graphs on the right hand side are presenting the peak specific impulse, which means specific to a given area. So if we were to integrate that specific impulse across an entire target area, such as a slab or a column, we would get the total impulse. So that's what we decide to validate our model against after this. So using experimental data, we validated our model for total impulse and the scatter points indicate experimental values. And the black dashed line is our instant prediction using our model there on the left hand side. So you can see there's a very good agreement here between the model prediction and the experimental values which give more validity to our simplified method. To summarize our results, we know that the peak specific impulse is the primary parameter that governs structural deformation under short duration loading. Predicting the distribution of this specific impulse remains a key challenge to the security community. We present here a fast running model that can create these loading distributions for spherical charges in the near field. So what are the next steps for us? As the physics of the scenarios we want to model become more complex due to different types of charge or shapes, we need to use more sophisticated machine learning models such as neural networks. These machine learning approaches allow computers to learn the link between the input and output, but they do have some very obvious limitations. Limitations of these black box solutions include that neural networks typically don't perform well when they extrapolate outside of the training data set, whereas physics inspired models do. So the big challenge for us now going forward is how do we make our neural networks physics compliant? The methodology we presented here can be supplemented with more advanced machine learning approaches such as neural networks to model a, model a complex suite of scenarios that include charge shape, types, etc. And this will help lead us to a probabilistic based approach for risk based engineering. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, I was going to kick off with a with a question if people can can hear me. OK, there's a little bit of an echo. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, it was um, it's sort of, uh, interesting your comparison, uh, the model to CFD to experimental results that, that, that you've done uh, yourself and the team at Sheffield. I was sort of interested in how does it compare to, if you like, uh, normal normal practice. Uh, I mean, I realise it's a specialist field, but yeah, amongst, if you like, security and blast engineers that are doing this work for projects that are getting built. You know, what what's the how does your work compare to that current best practice, and how do people do it at at the moment? Do they just have to run huge CFD models? Is there something? Uh, do there are already some sort of uh, shortcuts or approaches or, or empirical relationships that can get them there? quicker without having days of CFD? Yeah, so in the in the far field, like I uh, mentioned 
quite early on, we, we've got existing methods which have come out sort of from research from the 50s, 60s and 70s and so on, which actually are still very useful to this day. And that's what a lot of the uh, loading curves are based on. Um, the literature suggests that in near field and extreme near field scenarios, which is typically uh, the realm that we're looking at in this research, um, these sort of more crude predictive methods aren't as accurate. But, um, but does the accuracy matter? Is it that they're just hugely over conservative or are they under conservative or you know, what does it mean in practice then? Well, it's we need uh, so there was a paper published um, by my supervisor Sam Rigby and they've discovered that to to accurately model a material response uh, you really need to have that full awareness of how that loading is distributed so that's the sort of information that you wouldn't get with these less accurate methods so it's I think the big picture thinking is that if we can get this working and connect that to um, a fast running material response then we have the ability to model a, an entire range of different loading distributions and then instantly get how that material would respond and then it can be tailored to certain risk profiles um, but okay. I think current practices if you're if you're you know analyzing um, close in destinations it would be still CFD sort of simulations Okay, thanks. Um, I think uh, Matt, my fellow judge Matt Harrison, has, has a question. Perfect. Um, so I've got one very quick question and then a slightly more detailed question. Firstly, for your um, machine learning libraries, um, well, what machine learning libraries did you use? Um, so what the work we're doing at the moment, we are using Keras in Python. Okay, yeah. Um, and then my slightly longer question is, um, Obviously, this deals with the kind of the explosive air blast. Um, but do you see any um, kind of spin-off projects or f future work looking at um, like explosive debris as well? Because I understand, you know, most explosions, there's it's not just gas that's expanding. There's a lot of chunks of stuff coming with it as well. Uh, that's a good question. I, I believe um, some of some members of our research group do that sort of. It's not something I'm particularly uh, experienced with, um, but I can imagine it being you, you would be able to include those sorts of features in in these models as because that's that's one of the um, advantages of these sort of complex machine learning approaches is that you can you can kind of chuck more data in and, and see these patterns emerge. Um, but again, as the challenge for us is that we want to make sure it remains physics compliant so that Yes. Cool. Thank you. And I think we've just got time for a question from Dennis. Okay. Um, Jordan, I just want to ask is how is your research work related to sort of key element design you talked about at the beginning of your presentation? You know, currently structural engineer using key element design working to thirty four kilonewton per meter square. How does your work related to this more um, you know aesthetic types of loading I suppose the um, where I mentioned element it was more uh, as, a, as a consideration that the structural engineers have uh, taken into account through these designs so I think um, from sort of my experience in structural engineering these uh, layouts or column layouts, etc., might change as the architect wants to change something. So it's it's when do you run these um, accurate complex models? And once you run them, uh, say a few columns change, it, it could massively change what the loading distribution um, in an area would be. So that's trying to push towards this fast running uh, accurate approach, uh, which would then allow us to kind of constantly keep this in mind um, but, it, but I suppose it's not directly doing analysis we haven't really moved on to the material response or key element response uh, in this research it's more just the load quantification side 